how Afghanistan became the graveyard of empires. The Taliban recaptured Kabul, Afghanistan's capital city, on August 15, 2021, after a nearly 20-year absence. Following the withdrawal of the U.S.-led coalition, the Taliban regrouped and resumed its outward expansion, encountering minimal resistance from the Afghan National Army, which had been trained and equipped by Western troops. The Taliban became even more aggressive, launching a near blitzkrieg style assault to reclaim villages, towns, cities, and finally entire provinces, until they were once again in near total control of a region that has apparently only known war for the last 50 years. Afghanistan under the Taliban was always the land that opposed the influence of outsiders with tenacity, intensity, and always in blood. The attempts by the world's greatest powers to bring Afghanistan in accordance culturally with the wider world's perspective, especially in terms of the treatment of women and the application of science and technology, have created an arena where the tools of the modern world came into conflict with the determination of the old. Yet almost every foreign power that has gotten invoked with Afghanistan has ultimately failed in its mission there, leading Afghanistan to become known as the Graveyard of Empires. Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. Today we are talking about part one of the modern history of Afghanistan, the origins and ideology of the Taliban, and their rise, fall, and return to power. So let's get going. In the 19th century, the land of Afghanistan was caught between two sides, as it served as a boundary between the Russian Empire in the north and the British Empire, which controlled British India, modern-day Pakistan in the south. This imperial rivalry became known as the Great Game of the Two. Britain was the more aggressive when it came to controlling the country, having fought two major conflicts over control of the territory, the second of which saw Afghan land ceded to Britain and a loss of control over the handling of its foreign affairs. Afghanistan, being a landlocked country and therefore reliant on the good graces of its neighbors to allow the passage of diplomats and traders. By the end of the 19th century, Afghanistan had become a client nation of Britain, receiving British weapons, goods, and money in exchange for helping keep the rival Russian Empire at bay. However, the establishment of the Durand Line which finally clearly defined Afghanistan's borders saw many tribes, such as the Pashtun people divided between Afghanistan and India. Naturally, the Pashtuns refused to accept this line, having lived on the land for hundreds of years. And so nomadic tribes often crossed the new border as they always had done. By the second decade of the 20th century, Afghanistan was a country of two worlds with the old tribal ways existing in the countryside. While in the cities such as the capital Kabul, more modern concepts of statehood under King Halibullah flourished. Afghanistan's ruling class were now tired of having to live under the insult of being a puppet of the British and demanded full independence. It would not be until after Halibullah was assassinated by his son Amanullah, who then took the throne from his elder brother after having reigned for just one week, that Afghanistan declared its independence. This sparked the Third Anglo-Afghan War, beginning on May 6, 1919, which lasted two years, after which Afghanistan earned its freedom. However, peace did not come to Afghanistan for Amanullah, who wanted to have total rule over his kingdom, and that meant shifting power away from tribal and religious leaders who naturally opposed such a move. Thus, throughout his short reign, Amanullah fought a series of uprisings, opposed to his reforms, even when those reformers benefited the people, such as giving ordinary Afghans greater levels of education and the right to own land. Amanullah was toppled from power in 1929, and after a brief power struggle, Nadir Khan emerged victorious and seized the throne. Khan allowed the tribal leaders to retain much of their power, but he still had to contend with dissent amongst some ethnic communities, and in 1933, he was assassinated and succeeded by his son Zahir. So his reign would last significantly longer than his father's, but was marked by ideological upheaval, spurred on by his uncles who were successive prime ministers in his government. In 1955, Zahir's cousin, Dawood, took the role of prime minister, and he convinced the king to turn to the Soviet Union for military aid. Then, in 1963, 
Zahir carried out his boldest move yet, when he tried to develop a constitutional monarchy under the policy of the new democracy, which lasted from 1964 to 1973. During this time, intellectuals enjoyed greater freedom while women began to enter the workplace and government. However, despite the name legislation, governing the establishment of political parties in Afghanistan failed to materialize. In 1973, Dawood led a coup against Zahir, supported by the military and the Soviet Union, and he took effective control of the government. Under Dawood, the country again underwent sweeping reforms that aimed to create a modern socialist Islamic state. In the cities, men and women discarded their traditional ropes and began wearing Western-style clothing. As they studied and worked together for the first time, much to the disdain of the more conservative elements of Afghan society. Just five years after taking power, Dawood lost it all when he faced his own coup on April 27, 1978 at the hands of the Communist Afghanistan People's Democratic Party, or APDA, who crucially inspired the military to join them. In the wake of the coup, the APDA then found itself torn on what to do now. It had the power, and two factions arose within its ranks. In the end, the faction led by Noor Mohammed Taraki emerged victorious and expelled those in the party who would not follow him. Taraki instigated even more radical reforms for Afghanistan, imposing a strict socialist regime supported by the neighboring Soviet Union. As this was the height of the Cold War between East and West, the United States were deeply troubled by the links between Taraki's government and the Soviets and what this would mean for the region. And so when local leaders in Afghanistan opposed Taraki's reforms, they were quietly supported by the United States with money and weapons. Recognizing that Iraqi socialist policies often clashed with traditional Islamic norms in Afghanistan, the U.S. encouraged further resistance, claiming that the communists at home and abroad were godless and determined to stamp out Islam. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union, while supporting of Taraki, recognized that he was moving too quickly and implored him to slow his reforms in order to address the growing resentment from the tribal leaders. Taraki refused and was soon facing uprisings, not only from the countryside, but from within his own military who helped him seize power. In September 1979, Afghanistan was on the verge of a full-blown civil war. When Taraki was assassinated by a rival in the APDA by the name of Avizullah Amin, who took the reign of power. Amin entered into negotiations with the United States for assistance in restoring order, which of course pleased Washington, but horrified Moscow. If Afghanistan became an American ally, then American forces could be based on the Soviet Union's southern borders, a potentially serious destabilizing factor in the ongoing Cold War. Thus, to prevent this, on Christmas Eve 1979, to the world's shock, Soviet troops crossed the border into Afghanistan, supported by large numbers of tanks, armored personnel carriers, and combat aircraft. Soviet leader Brezhnev told the world that they had been invited to the country to help restore order, but in reality, they were there to maintain their grip on the land and keep the Americans out. During the course of the invasion, Amin was killed by Soviet troops and his government was replaced by one led by Babrik Karmel, who was seen as more compliant with Soviet wishes. However, this was no quick-fix solution for the Soviets, who very quickly found themselves combating tribes and factions opposed to their influence, with many Afghans viewing them as an army of crusaders come to destroy their faith. The Soviets were therefore forced to settle into a bloody, brutal, and ongoing military campaign to hold the country. International condemnation of the Soviet invasion was quick, and especially strong in the U.S. and U.K. In a phone call between the recently elected British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and U.S. President Jimmy Carter on the afternoon of the invasion, Carter outlined the U.S. position by saying, First of all, we regard the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan as an extremely grave development. They have in effect changed a proper nation into a puppet nation, and I think it will have profound strategic consequences on the stability of that entire region. Secondly, I think it is essential that we make this action as politically costly as possible to the Soviet Union. 
I don't think we can afford to let them get away with this, with impunity. The Western powers thus imposed economic sanctions on the Soviet Union, and in 1980, the UK and US boycotted the Moscow Olympic Games. Although athletes from both nations still competed independently, however, it would not be long before the West took a more active role in supporting anti-communist Afghan forces against the Soviets. Initially, Western intelligence agencies such as the CIA and MI6 acquired weapons such as assault rifles and then had them delivered to the groups fighting the Soviets via Pakistan and over time this aid would grow. In Afghanistan, Soviet forces very quickly seized control of the major population centers and the KGB was soon rounding up anyone opposed to their intervention. However, given the more nomadic nature of many of the more rural communities, they soon found it was difficult to locate them as they were almost always on the move or hiding away in caves and mountains, making planning attacks against them extremely difficult. The Soviet position was made all the more complicated by the lack of suitable maps of Afghanistan, many of which had inaccuracies of up to several miles. Thus, the Soviet Air Force began a massive aerial survey operation using aircraft such as the Antonov AN-30 to draw the most detailed maps of Afghanistan ever made by that point in history. On the ground, Soviet troops used tactics divided for combating NATO in Western Europe. But obviously, these were hopelessly ineffective against a guerrilla force who knew their terrain and only engaged in battle on their terms. Roads and tracks were especially deadly to Soviet troops and were almost never traversed in unarmored vehicles because to do so was to invite death. Soviet propaganda often depicted their soldiers in Afghanistan digging wells and building schools, but the reality was very different. Confidence amongst them was quickly weakened as conscripts found themselves taken out of their hometowns and thrust into an almost alien world fighting a war for which there appeared no end in sight. Like amongst many American soldiers in a similar predicament during the height of the Vietnam War, the Soviet soldiers often took to alcohol and drugs to help them cope and this inevitably led to a breakdown in discipline amongst many units. To be continued. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments down below. Till then, be safe.